Tonight we are pleased to present I Do Not Know My Ancestors But I Know Who I Am, a panel discussion moderated by Kevin Booker. In early meetings about home going, we talked about how the book raises the questions, who am I and where do I come from? They seem like such simple questions, but for many people, the answers are not so simple. Kevin had moderated a panel for us last year, and we knew he was the right person to tackle the subject. Mr. Booker was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. His commitment to uplifting and educating people began at an early age when he discri experienced discrimination based on both his race and where he grew up. Defying the odds, Mr. Booker went on to achieve various degrees through the support of his family and strong mentors. He now teaches college and high school level classes, trains men and women who have been sexually assaulted, facilitates, le facilitates leadership in diversity workshops, lectures, mentors, and speaks publicly all over the country to encourage people who have been disenfranchised to understand the power of education. Kevin organized and gathered the participants for tonight's panel, and so I'm gonna let him introduce uh, our other guests. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Booker. Good evening. Good evening. It is an honor to be here. It really is. It is so awesome to be here. First of all, I want to give a round of applause to Betty Ann Ryder and Ann Campbell for putting this, this event together for one book, one region. Their enthusiasm and what they contribute to this community is awesome. Please give them a round of applause. Also, for tonight, we are going to have fun. We're going to have an awesome discussion. Now, one of the things I always do before um, I begin my events, I do a greeting. And the reason why I greet individuals in various different languages is because it represents the community, our community, our community, which is New London County. And I would like to say good evening. Good evening. Buenos noches. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bon dia. Bon dia. Buongiorno. Nihao. Mermenjes. Dobre utro. Namaste. Sowadi. Chawim. Manga nangu manga. Como ye? So pa wanang sung. Assalamu alaikum. Privet. Guggentag. Calamara. And as they say in some neighborhoods, what's good? <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason why, like I said, I start off because we're going to have an awesome dis conversation tonight on home going. What is your home? Where is your home? Where's your land? How do you, how do you identify yourself as a human being? We're going to touch on some very various topics with this awesome panel, panelists tonight. And we're going to have a great conversation about some of these topics. But before we begin the panel discussion, I have two awesome poets that I would like to introduce. And one of the poets, he goes by the name of Johnny Miller. Johnny Miller has been all over Connecticut sharing his story of bullying, suicide, and depression. At 12 years old, he was contemplating suicide to where today he speaks about his experience. And he started his organization, Save One, when he was 15 years old. And he is only 19 years old today. Johnny Miller, he's, his poems electrify many of the youth and people throughout the state and also the country. And he did his first TED Talk when he was 16 years old. Please give a round of applause for Johnny Miller from Save One. So um, I have a poem for you guys today. It's, um, I know we're talking more about labels. So last night, I'm just hanging out, and I'm like, let me write something different. Yeah, I have tons of poems, but let me write something fresh. Let me write something to do with labels, right? 
So um, here we go. The biggest issue in society is labels. We all have been handed down labels, words that say who you are, words that people come up with to define you. There's good and bad labels, but sometimes those labels don't correctly define you. Do not let a label create you, yet instead you create the label. The issue is that sometimes we create the wrong label. If your label was written on your hand, would you still be beautiful? From the labels on my left hand that say stupid, ugly, worthless, and weird, to the words on my right hand, the right words that truly define me, that say beautiful, smart, loving, and caring, that is who I am. Those were once the labels I believed, but these are the true labels in who I am. People may label us, and oftentimes we label others as well. But instead of negatively, we need to build each other up. We need to speak life over others. At 12 years old, the label suicidal was facing me. The labels on my left hand were those that killed me, those that made my life not worth living. It took the friends and family and God to build me back up, to write those labels on my right hand where today I can stand, I can share with you where I have been, where I am, and where I would love to go. But you see, we all have been handed down labels, but the question is, what will we do with those labels? Allow them to push us further, build us up, or take us down? We need to make a difference in this world. I now have the label difference maker. Out, of, out to make a difference and show others how much they are truly worth. So if your label was written on your hands, would you still be beautiful? Please give another round of applause for Johnny Miller of Save One. The next poet I'm going to bring up, he goes by the name of Marco Anthony Farbetti. And Marco Anthony Farbetti is a New London-based poet, word artist. He has overcome many obstacles in his life, racial profiling, bullying, insecurity, and self-doubt. He was born and raised in New Britain, Connecticut. He battled and has been set free from a 10-year battle of opiate addiction. He created a movement called Stop the Lie, and where he shares his story through poems and empowers the younger generation to use their talents for good. And in, in New London, he is a youth leader and an urban missionary at his church. Give a round of applause for Marco Farbetti. Listen, I'm going to get straight to the point. Because nowadays, if you dare to be different, people are going to hate, they're going to stare, they're going to point. They're going to laugh and say things under their breath. But since they don't value themselves, y'all, well, I guess there's really nobody else to respect. But uh, don't ever let their comments change how you're living. Because it's the ones who wasn't cool in school who end up coming here to make a difference. For me, there's only one way to live, and that's free. See, I'm free from lies, I'm free from pain, I'm free no change. See, freedom reigns for those with the right mindset. But nowadays, the truth be like a secret. Shh. They're out here making it hard for you to find it. But I'm this. I'm free. I'm so free from what they think. After all, they're just thoughts. See, now it's only me. My friends were supposed to help me stop the lie, but it got bought. The guy said I made my people to cry, yet y'all gonna be satisfied with the fact you ain't died yet before 25? All right. Man, we gotta do better. Because here comes the winter. I'm going to buckle up and come up with a plan for the summer. And um, who says I'm not a man of color? I said, who says I'm not a man of color? And who says I'm not one of the brothers? Because the definition of a brother is another equal human being who's running the same race. So whoever said unity was limited to one race straight laughing in teeth. I am unique. And there's nobody like me. And I came here to the Groton Public Library to turn down the value of anybody coming to stereotype me. <laughs> you see? I moved from the inner city to a small town, not even a city. I hope y'all with me. And I was different from the jump. I went from New Britain, Connecticut, trying not to get jumped. 
to living in a white town, being profiled by police when I'm a black face, but they identified my speech and stay on the clothes with the black race, so I will be stopped, searched, and told to stay black face on the pavement. All that made me do is hate them. And this would happen often, bro. But what's ironic is the only one that helped me was the only black officer. Huh. So, dear young canvases out there, do not leave your brush in the world's hands or try painting you. And that's a message for us all, because they make white crayons for black paper too. So I gotta be careful how I'm speaking to y'all. That's why I only write what the truth is and my truth plan. I came to stop the lies so the truth win. Because these fake rappers, same color, will hustle and trap you. So do I gotta be the one to speak up for the black youth? Eh, maybe they'll stop and see my views. I mean, just imagine my life. I'm like a blank outline. This white skin just makes it perfect for them to try to color me in with all their ideas and opinions of who I should be. But if I listened, I'd still be in that prison. I would have never caught this vision of who I could be. But I wanted to learn. Like how diversity is just really variety. But why nowadays it turns into bullying and segregation? In a world of more, not less, we're all limited, narrow-minded, and racist? And I hate this. And I hate that I hate this. But at the same time, with hate, how can I erase this? So I came here to tackle the issue by spreading love on my pages. I'm different. And y'all all heard the saying, right? Get in where you fit in. But I'm here to tell you if you never step out, then you'll never make a difference. That's just my views. Thank you. Give another round of applause for Marco for Betty. Awesome. I told you we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We're going to enjoy these conversations. So now it's time for our extraordinary panelists. OK? So first person I'm going to bring up is Dr. Roger Staggers Hakeem. She is the founder and executive director of Cheer Institute, a nonprofit organization committed to addressing health and inequities in Connecticut. Additionally, Dr. Staggers is principal of Chair Consulting Group, where she provides diversity training and technical assistance for educational and healthcare organizations nationally. Dr. Staggers Hakeem has over 15 years of experience working with and advocating on behalf of the health and social concerns of disenfranchised populations over 10 years teaching in higher education. Dr. Staggers Hakeem has worked with national organizations around addressing health inequities and pursuing health equity. A graduate of Howard University and New York University, Dr. Staggers holds a doctorate in medical sociology and race, class, and gender studies, and a master's of public health and community health education. Dr. Staggers has written extensively about health inequities and the social de detriments of health. Her most recent article is The Nation's Unprotected Children and the Ghosts of Michael Mike Brown was published in the Journal of Health and Human Behavior in 2016, an edited book, Police and Unarmed Black Male Crisis, Advancing e Effective Pre Prevention Strategies in 2017. Dr. Sagas Hakeem is currently the Director of Equity, Inclusion, and Civic Engagement at Yale University Divinity School. Give a round of applause for Dr. Roger Hakeem Staggers. Staggers Hakeem, yes. The next panel that we panelists we have coming up is Patrick Gomar. Gumar? She and Gomar. She and Gumar. <laughs> Works in engagement and is a violence prevention educator for Safe Futures, which is domestic violence and sexual assault agency for our area. His work there encompasses teaching, healthy relations, health relationships programming and schools, training sports coaches on health, running after school boys and club, boys clubs for middle school students, facilitating groups for men who have been abused, facilitating groups for male victims of violence, answering the hotline and doing counseling one-on-one -on -one with victims of all genders. With a BA from Earlham College and Peace and Global Studies, he worked on a number of different nonprofit fields before coming to Safe Futures. He worked at Reconciliation Center with Catholic and Protestant teenagers from Republic and North of Ireland at a mental health agency here in SECT, as well as a fatherhood support program aimed on helping men become more engaged and nurturing caregivers. 
Give a round of applause for Patrick. Yeah. Our next panelist is Christina Nocito. Christina Nocito, she says, I am an Asian American and I was born in Hawaii. I grew up in New London, attending New London schools. Graduated from New London High School in 1996. I took classes at UConn, Three Rivers, and Tuxis Community College to earn an associate's degree in liberal arts and sciences and in criminal justice. I returned to college and earned my bachelor's in, ju in justice studies from SNHU in 2015, which is Southern New Hampshire University. I have worked for Chelsea Groton Bake for 19 years and completed Connecticut School of Finance and Management and completed a Chamber of Commerce Leadership Program and attended the Disney Institute Leadership Program. She currently works on the Board of Directors for OIC and a number of Shoreline Roller Derby League. She also enjoys volunteering for many functions throughout South, Southeastern Connecticut. She has a son named Anthony and she resides in New London. Her hobbies are staying active, reading books, and also relaxing at home on the beach. Give a round of applause for Christina Nocito. Our next panelist is Chris Soto. Awesome. He is a representative and currently his first time in Connecticut General Assembly, representing New London. In that capacity, he serves as House Vice Chair of Appropriations Committee, among other committees. Chris arrived in New London to attend the United States Coast Guard Academy and graduate with a bachelor's degree and operations research. Following graduation, he served five years on active duty as a Coast Guard officer with tours in Miami and in New York, primarily in law enforcement roles. He left the service to enter the education field, first as the Assistant Director of Diversity back at the Coast Guard Academy. This, this was followed by his pursuit of a graduate degree at Brown University, earning a master's in public affairs. Prior to joining the legislator, Chris represented Southeastern Connecticut on a former Latino and Puerto Rican Affairs Commission, now the Commission on Equity and Opportunity. Outside of, legislator, outside of the legislator, Chris currently serves as the founder and director of Higher Education, a college co completion organization with offices in New London and Willimant Willimantic that guides Eastern Connecticut's low income and first generation college bound students on a path to college degree and beyond. Chris Soto currently serves as the founder and director of Higher Edge, a college completion organization with offices in New London and Willimantic. Chris also is left, left, the service to, left the service and entered education field first as an assistant director back at the Coast Guard Academy. This was followed by his pursuit Wow, jeez. I don't know. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> so when Chris was recently elected, most important, Chris was elected a state representative of Connecticut 39th District, New London. In this capacity, he serves as the House Vice Chair of Appropriations Committee, among other committees. Give a round of applause to Chris Soto. <laughs> oh, man. Next person we have is. Principal Lindsay Thompson. Lindsay Thompson is currently the principal of Environmental Science Magnet School at Mary Hooker, a pre-K through eighth grade magnet school in Hartford, Connecticut. Ms. Thompson studied mathematics secondary education at Minnesota State University in Mankato before for her bachelor's degree and, re and received her master's degree in public school leadership from Teachers College at Columbia University. Before becoming a principal, Ms. Thompson taught high school math at Hartford Public High School. She hails from the cold state of Minnesota and loves tater tot hot dish. She comes from, <laughs> she comes from a long family line of educators, firmly believes that education is the most powerful weapon for children to possess today. Give a round of applause for Principal Lindsay Thompson. Please give a wonderful round of applause for this awesome panelist. 
We are going to have some fun tonight. All right. The first question, when I was thinking about this discussion, one of the first questions that came to my mind when I think about this very diverse panel of all different backgrounds, and I thought about it, I was like, who can I have on this panel? And I want a very diverse panel because we're discussing some very serious issues, especially issues that still impact our nation in so many ways today. So the first question I wanted to ask all of you is, how do you racially or ethnically identify yourself and why? Okay, whoever would like to take the lead on that one. How do you racially and ethnically identify yourself and why? I'll start. Um, I identify myself as African American. Mm -hmm. um, and why do I identify myself as such? Um, and I would actually say African American and black. And I would say, I, I would use both. Um, African, I would say, and American uh, to um, recognize my connection to Africa. And I say black uh, as well, um, because everyone does not, I think that people oftentimes uh, lump everyone together as African American. And um, there are, we, I live in uh, Bloomfield, Connecticut, which is a huge Caribbean population. And people are not necessarily going to identify as African American. They would say that I'm Jamaican, I am Trinidadian, et cetera. And when I use black, um, I do that consciously at certain times so that I also identify with other people um, who share African ancestry. Um, so I might sp speak to that, and I, I selectively do that at times. But I myself am I'm African American, and that's why I identify myself. Okay. Thank you. Um, personally, as I was introduced, um, I'm Asian American, and I think that's kind of how you were, I was taught to label myself when I was little. Um, you know, you fill out those forms for your SATs, and there's a little bubbles. Which one do I choose? Am I Asian? Am I white? Because I am half white. Um, am I Pacific Islander? You know, you don't really know the um, meaning of that. Um, but now, I just kind of describe myself as a mix of lots of different races. Um, yes, I am half Filipino. Um, my dad actually recently, in the past few years, found out we were part African American um, by going on, you know, one of those lineage websites and finding out that um, even though my maiden name is McLaughlin, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my great great grandfather was actually the son of a slave master and a slave um, whose last name was McLaughlin. So, in the past few years, I've kind of evolved who I think I am and to include more races. So. Mm. I usually just identify myself as uh, I usually identify myself as white, um, but that's really by default. Mm -hmm. um, we're not really told to call ourselves European American, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like white becomes the almost like the normal choice mm -hmm. as a white kid growing up. That's what it feels like. Um, my family is very proud of their Irish heritage, so I often describe myself as Irish American. But um, I've started trying to be a pain on the bubble forms by filling in like European American, but uh, growing up, uh, kind of unlike Patrick, um, I knew I was Swedish and Norwegian. Um, I knew that's where my grandparents uh, were coming from, but it wasn't something that was maybe talked about a lot or celebrated. Um, and it wasn't really until um, I had moved out to Connecticut and had a roommate who was 100% Swedish and loved being Swedish um, that I learned a lot about uh, Sweden, even though my grandmother was 100% Swedish. It just wasn't something that we talked a lot about, different traditions or, um, uh, or things that were different for her growing up as a first generation immigrant to, um, to the United States either. So, uh, but I've always identified myself as white or Caucasian. And I, uh, I self-identify as Latino, and uh, kind of like Patrick, I, however I'm feeling at the time when I'm when I have bubbles in front of me, um, you know, I usually self-identify in terms of race, uh, black, white, and Indian because that's what our ancestors are, mm -hmm. um, and also did a kind of a lineage test and kind of saw some of that reflected mm -hmm. in that, and so so I was like, okay, good, I'm actually pretty accurate here, but um. But yeah, for the most part, I d identify as Latino. And I think that's in the context of being an American um, because you know, as Latinos, we tend to get proud of our ethnic background. So my parents are Puerto Rican and Cuban, um, but I, I kind of supersede that with Latino because in some ways, 
the lens that people look at you is just as a Latino male, it doesn't really matter. And I can get into that later, but Absolutely. I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. In the past 12 years, um, social media has put a spotlight on injustices that have been occurring around our nation. How does it make you feel to hear, when you hear the rhetoric, go back to your country, go back to where you came from? Is there a way we can stop this neg negative rhetoric that we're hearing throughout the country? I mean, I think it's probably lack of education or ignorance or, um, I don't like hearing those things because um, it just doesn't make sense to me. Go back to your country, go back where you came from. We all came from somewhere and we're all here now. So to say those things just doesn't really apply anymore. Um, I recently had a friend who said, uh, like, you know, it's cookout time, it's summertime, and said, oh, we don't go, us black people don't go to pic picnics, we go to cookouts. I'm like, well, what's the difference? And, <laughs> and he, you know, started to explain to me the meaning of picnic versus um, a cookout, which had to do, the picnic had to do with hangings and things like that many, many years ago. And I'm like, okay, thanks for the correction. But, you know, to me, it's all in the same word. Or, you know, you get the same comment as, I can't be in the room with more than X amount of white people. But I was like, but I don't understand those things. So when these types of comments come out, I just feel bad and sorry for those people who say that. So um, I have a little exercise I'd ask everybody to do based on this question. So if you close your eyes for a second, and if I say, the word immigration, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? You can open your eyes. And just pot, throw out some words. What is that? Ellis Island. Ellis Island. Any other ones? Deportation. Deportation. Enforcement. Enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, did Mexico come into anybody's mind? There was a few, right? Um, and I, I do this exercise with a class I used to teach, and the reason why I asked that question is because, based on the question, right, the media is, is filling our mind with images, and subconsciously we're even thinking about things. And, um, you know, what it has come down to, it's not even about your origin anymore, right? When, if you have the image of Mexico as immigration, that that shows you the level of conditioning our brains are going through being here in the United States and what the image of immigration looks like, right? Because it doesn't matter what your ethnic origin is, it just matters that you're basically from this country that we have illustrated as the face of immigration. And so um, I just kind of put that out there. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, I think that, that social media and the media in general are are helping frame, unfortunately, both good and bad, um, how we see immigration in our country. Yeah, for me, I mean, I guess I, I've only heard other white people say this, right? Um, and where I go is that it just, um, it shows a complete unawareness of, of our own history. You know, my, my mom's side of the family is Irish and they, and they came here as refugees and, and asylum seekers. But my dad's side's been here since the 1630s. And, and like, we know what our family did. We've, it's documented, like our participation in massacres, like here. Um, my direct ancestor, Nicholas Olmsted, was one of General Mason's soldiers and, and lit fire to people's homes, like in Mystic, mm -hmm. um, which destroyed the Pequot tribe. And so, like when you know, like, how we got this country, and you truly like process that, I don't think you can say that out loud again. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, you're like hey, hey, like yeah, this, is, this was my massacre, like right. <laughs> we get to keep it now. Um, and so for me, it's a, an unawareness of like what it means to be white in this country, or what it means to have that heritage. Mm. I guess understanding maybe more of where it's coming from, from that person, like what does that, what does that even mean to go back to your country or where does that what does that even mean um, to go back to where you're from because most of us um, where we're from may be the place that we currently are residing so what does that even mean and um, I think usually when it's said it's not said in a space where people want to talk about 
you know the background of that or actually have a dialogue it's more it's meant out of hate it's meant um, it's meant to hurt someone and so um, you know I think it it goes back to uh, where are these messages being taught or heard and whether it's on social media or from families or um, the neighbor next door that it's all part of our own responsibilities to call these things out as ignorance and um, and want to educate ourselves so we hear things like this we hear these this aggressive tone or this aggressive language um, to ostracize many people um, that we then can speak about it. So if you do have an opportunity then to call it out and have a discussion um, that you can speak out of um, understanding and, um, and not ignorance um, yourself. You know, Patrick, just to reiterate what you just, you know, you just mentioned so eloquently, um, you said, you know, you only hear from white people that type of hostile language you know, go back to your own country, you know, because you mentioned that your family was here in Mystic back 1630. So when you think about that concept of how you mentioned how a person of European descent can trace their lineage. Mm -hmm. So do people of European descent have a stronger connection to their ancestral lineage than black or, than your, than your black or brown colleagues? And why or why not do you believe that? Do they have a stronger connection to the ancestral lineage? Because how you can trace your lineage mm -hmm. is, and, and do you feel on the panel, do you feel like that's, that's something that creates maybe tension on so many levels or maybe something internal that you have to reflect on saying, do I have that connection as well? So, I mean, what do you, what do you think on the panel? I, I think, Part of that is, is what we mean by connection. Mm -hmm. I think that if someone someone can cannot know um, if, from as an African American, I um, will not at this point. I haven't actually done um, tracing of my ancestry specifically mm -hmm. to what region of West Africa mm -hmm. my family comes from, as well as other um, aspects of, of my ethnicity. Um, but I can still hold a very close and feel very much tied to my culture mm -hmm. in, in African culture uh, without necessarily knowing. Mm. And that is confirmation for me about the connection that I have to land and to other people. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned before the two in terms of using the language of, of black at times and using that um, purposefully. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's, that's something that I choose to do <laughs> on language that I choose specifically and in certain context. And part of that though too is recognizing the connection to other aspects of culture. I recall years back um, when I was at Howard, um, we were having a conversation with a number of students. The department was quite diverse in terms of people coming from different regions. Um, in um, Caribbean, continental African, and, and folks from African American, we were just sharing about diet. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about different types of grains and then also type different types of music, and just even recognizing the connection. So I think that as people, even though people don't necessarily ha or, or don't have the ability to connect to certain regions or land or time period. People can still be very much tied to and connected to their ancestry. Mm. Okay. Mm. Anyone else? I think um, going back to the question, um, growing up, I didn't have much of a connection. I knew um, my grandmother was Swedish, and I knew my other grandmother was Norwegian. Um, but there wasn't for my family. There wasn't a strong connection. We knew our family tree, who the people were, but not necessarily a strong connection to the ethnic heritage of it. And I feel at a loss sometimes when I have these discussions, even with my students at school, and they can share long lists of uh, where, where their uh, family originated from, how they made it to Connecticut, in Hartford in particular, um, or in other towns in Connecticut. And I don't necessarily know those answers, and I think partly, um, you know, I didn't ask those questions maybe when I was younger uh, of my grandparents before they passed, but um, I don't always feel a strong connection there. I feel like there's a loss of not really knowing. Um, so I don't think necessarily because I'm of European descent do I have a stronger connection. Um, I think that that's more of an individual piece, but I also think it is challenging when you have families that were uh, broken up and stolen and pushed into countries um, and ripped apart from their families very purposefully to end um, to end family lineage and strength of family and strength of ethnicity and belonging and um, so that could be true um, but I think um, I don't think it's necessarily true just about uh, European Americans either. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Thank you. I, I would oh. agree. Um, I'm speaking for my father right now. So he didn't really know a lot about his uh, mother's family. Mm -hmm. We just knew that my grandmother on her side was from England. Um, and my grandfather was probably Italian because last name Franco. Um, so, and for some reason, my grandmother was very tight lipped about certain things. She never opened up to my father about that side of the family. Um, he always wondered about his father's side of the family. Again, they were kind of quiet, but there were always little questions as to his true ethnicity because he had a little bit different hair um, and he had heard some rumors when he was growing up. So when he did his ancestral dig online, he was able to fill in some of those questions about his father's side, um, wondering you know, where his father came from, uh, his true lineage on that side, and finding the African-American side of his father's side. So on the European side, he wasn't too successful. On the African-American side, we were able to meet them and fill in all those gaps, mm -hmm. meet the family. They could tell us all this history about my father's family that he didn't know, um, and now he knows and is grateful for it. Um, for, for me, like, I definitely grew up in a family where we, we knew our heritage, but, um, and it was important, and my mom's side as well, are very proud of kind of Irish activism. Um, but I also want to highlight, like, it's, it's a privilege to be able to do that, uh, that a lot of people can't, but we only passed on like, what we were proud of. Mm. You know, we, we, didn't, we yeah. didn't inherit the stories of like, here's the horrible thing your great, great grandfather right. did. Right. Um, and so it's, it takes work now to find that stuff. You know, the story of Nicholas Olmsted, we didn't know until genealogy in the 1990s. Mm. And so, um, so it's more complex than just like, are you proud of your legacy? It's like, we, we need to do research to really know it now. Because mm. they were, I think, maybe ashamed or um, maybe unconsciously ashamed, but right. they didn't pass it on. Can I add to what thank you're you. saying, though, too? And I, I thank you for saying that, just yeah. the way that you said it. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and I, I love the way that you said that, because that, that, that's history, and that's what gets into history books, right, in terms of picking and choosing what part of the story people want to um, tell folks. And, and this, this continues in terms of how uh, we are educated and how young people continue to be educated. So in terms of people saying, uh, go back to your country, when people pick and choose the stories that are shared, and that becomes the history that we know, then people don't have the foundation. And I'm not saying that people are um, innocent. I'm saying that they're ignorant, right? But I'm also saying that this is what we continue to see perpetuating. Um, people not having the information, the education, and it happening, and it, and it being institutionalized and systemic in some ways, us not actually being powered to know the stories and knowing our history. Mm. And you know, just to just to ask another, you know, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, Dr. Staggers. Um, for some of my white colleagues that are on the panel, when when you mentioned the fact that you know some of the some stories are for my marginalized groups, you know, some of those stories are not mentioned in history. How does that, for some of my white colleagues that are on the panel, how does that make you feel and, are, and how are you impacted by that? And for some of my, 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 pe my, my persons of color on the panel, how does that make you feel as well that your story is not mentioned um, in history books? Um, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in the General Assembly this year, we were taking up legislation on the casinos. Um, and this idea of building a third casino because of the threat of the MGM casino in, in Massachusetts. So you're thinking like, what does this have to do with this question? Um, but <laughs> what we saw was um, a real ignorance around the tribe's history in the state of Connecticut. Mm. And I was floored by the comments that I heard people vilifying the tribes you know, now, whatever you feel about their business decision to do what they do with casinos, that doesn't take away from their history of being on this land long before any of us were. And um, it really made me think about ways that we can um, educate Connecticut students, right, around our, our native brothers and sisters that were here long before us, right? If, if, did, raise your hand if you went to school in Connecticut, or the grammar school. Did you learn about the Mohegans or the Pequots? Some people did, most people shaking their head no. 
But so this is something that I would argue is probably something that should be in American history classes, right? Especially in the state of Connecticut and wherever else we're teaching history and, and those tribes that are native to those lands. So um, I think it, it is troubling. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the example that I saw most recently um, that makes me think about this question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And for some of our white colleagues as well on the mm -hmm. panel. I mean, the, the question is, how does it feel to kind of yeah. see that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I feel like I was lucky to have parents who, mm -hmm. who passed on that it's our responsibility mm -hmm. to try to, to keep digging, to, to tell the whole story. Right. Um, but even that's a process. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it feels hard. Um, you, you do have to look at what, you, um, there's a phrase, internalized depression, mm. right? But we don't talk about the internalized oppressor, mm. right? Like we usually point it at like who's receiving the oppression, not mm. like how do we pass on like what it means to to dominate for mm. centuries. Um, what it does it mean to create this system we live in now? And so, you know, that's the that's ongoing, right? That's just work you have to do every day. Um, mm -hmm. So there's self analysis. You try. Mm -hmm. um, and then you try to watch a comedy show once in a while. <laughs> you know, you try to, it is heavy, you know, you try to have balance, but, mm. but it's hard. That's right. Mm. Thank you, Patrick. Mm. Um, Principal Thompson? Um, well, I think as a, an educator and a principal, so um, just even thinking about so how social studies or history is taught in most schools. So I'm in elementary, middle school, and our students get social studies or history curriculum through their, uh, their reading curriculum. Um, but it's, it's very in brief. And who decides uh, what they learn? And the state of Connecticut, if anyone's an educator um, in the room, um, the standards for social studies or history education uh, have, have been accepted by some and not by others and have been rewritten. And in Hartford alone, there's been a social studies curriculum that has been started over and over and over again for the last 15 years to be written. Um, in a city that's very rich of history, you don't, you don't really need to go even outside of Hartford um, uh, to write the book, necessarily. Um, and I, I take it as a huge, um, um, I'm lost for words, uh, a huge responsibility for myself to make sure, one, that my teachers are educated. So my school is incredibly diverse, but most of my teachers, probably except for a handful, look like me and probably have very similar backgrounds to me, grew up in very similar communities. Um, and so they themselves have also learned history through the eyes of a conqueror or victor through their social studies curriculums. And so they may not know to question things. And so for myself, until I started traveling through uh, the end of high school and through college and now, I didn't really seek to understand because I didn't know what I didn't know. So I didn't seek to understand the other stories that really were unwritten, which is most of them. And so I, I take it as a, a responsibility for myself as the principal of the school, but also just an educator within um, the city to push or to share the information that I'm learning. So the trips that I go on to make sure that I'm sharing with my staff. Um, last summer, went to the Black Hills and got to meet a Laco uh, Lakota Indian, a Nat Native American who shared um, the story of his people, which is very different than the story that we read in the, um, the textbook. And so encouraging other teachers to pursue um, understanding, but they just don't know what they don't know. But I don't think that's an ignorance that we can be okay with. So if you have, um, if you have the information, needing to share that with other people, but taking the responsibility to educate your children, to educate your friends' children, um, and other adults that you're around, so that they start to become curious about the stories that are not shared and not told. And I think for myself, um, as I start learning the real history, um, it, it's frustrating to me, I think, because I, I've accepted stories that are very uh, untrue, and that, um, and so there's a, you know, there, sometimes I think there is a, um, an embarrassment maybe for believing the story that's not true or believing the story that's widely told but untrue. And so I think as, um, as a white American, I need to get over that embarrassment and accept that I've, I've heard and learned the wrong stories or I've heard one side mm -hmm. and I need to, um, to learn the other ones. And I also need to help others um, who look like me, who learned like I did, um, to get over that embarrassment as well and just kind of accept that we haven't learned the true truths to stories and that that's okay. 
and that um, we need to pursue the real understanding because the thing is, is we talk a lot about the next generation of leaders, but who are they learning from? They're learning from us as adults. And so we know um, the people we work with and interact on a daily basis. Um, and so it's, it's up to us to, to speak different stories to our kids, to encourage them to be curious um, because they're going to learn from us. They're not gonna learn anything different unless we're teaching them something different as well, so. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The theme tradition was mentioned throughout the, um, the book, this incredible book, Home Going, by Yao Gisi. What does tradition mean to you, and what family traditions have, will you pass down to, your, to the next generation and your family, or maybe even within your community? Uh, well, being half Filipino, um, my mom did pass down a couple traditions, and going to the Philippines, I learned some more. So in the book, they talk about um, a woman coming to womanhood, or young woman coming to womanhood. So when that happened to me, um, my mom went into the refrigerator and took an egg out of the carton and started rubbing the egg around my face. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and she's trying to explain to me, well, number one, we don't have chicken, so I can't grab a, a, you know, a freshly laid egg, but I wanna make your face as shiny as this egg for you know, fertility, new beginnings, you know, things like that. So that was my first step into tradition. Jeez on my mother's side was having an egg <laughs> um, rub against my face. Um, my mom did pass away a few years ago, but my father and I went to the Philippines after she passed away so I could meet the rest of the family. I've never met anyone, my grandmother, aunts, uncles, thousands of cousins, uh, till 2014. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to see what other traditions there were. So um, one was a sign of respect where because I'm older than a lot of my cousins, they would call me Auntie Christina, even though I might be the same age or just a little older, I was Auntie Christina, my father was Uncle Wayne. Um, or even those younger than me would take my hand, I'll, I'll demonstrate with Chris here, and um, hold it. <laughs> if I was the younger person, I would hold it to my head and ask for a blessing. And that happened almost every day, even if I saw that cousin every single day, during that visit, they would always ask for a blessing. A one-year-old to the 13, 14-year-old would always ask for my blessing. So those were interesting traditions awesome. to learn while, while they're in the Philippines. And I told my son, but he doesn't really do that to me. You know, ask for a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, respect. Anyone else like to share? I'll, I'll share. Um, I, I think, it, you know, as I'm processing the questions, um, and I think about identity, um, at part of this though too, that, that question is for some people not feeling connected to tradition, mm -hmm. so also uh, the need to create tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and this past year, um, um, I met with a group of wonderful people and um, helped to plan a coming of age ceremony for my son. And it was important to do that um, on one hand to definitely create tradition for my son uh, to speak to, someone told me to speak to the king in him. Um, and um, also, because this is something that I would want for him to do with his children mm -hmm. and for my great-grandchildren to do. So, so part of that too, you know, there is the tradition that, that may be passed down, whether we know it or not, or good or bad, speaking about the things that we've learned, <laughs> you know, and how we have to do the corrective learning, Absolutely. but also creating tradition mm -hmm. and understanding and being intentional Absolutely. about creating that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that that's important, I think, for all of us. Uh, recognizing that our existence is not just about us, right? right. But it's 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 about our legacy, Absolutely. you know, and, and pass and passing um, on traditions and, and, and good strong traditions that are meaningful to mm -hmm. those who come after us. Anyone else like to add on to that? Values of tradition. No. So in the book, Sonny says that the problem in America wasn't segregation, but the fact that you could not, in fact, segregate. What, is he, what does he mean by this? He says that the problem in America wasn't segregation, but the fact that you could not, in fact, segregate. Well, after reading the book and um, learning about Sonny, mm -hmm. you learn that he does not like white people. Right. So he mm -hmm. wasn't for um, integrating. He wanted to be segregated still. He did not want to ha have anything to do with white people, even though he had some little bit of white in him. I mean, right. he, uh, 
that's the point of view he was coming at, and that's what I took that part of, mm -hmm. um, which so, I thought was interesting. So just to elaborate with the way Sonny felt in the book, mm -hmm. have, you, have any of you ever felt that way in your own dealings, in your own life, you know, where you felt like, you know, like when you look at the Charlottesville situation that just occurred a few weeks ago, and you're like, oh my God, he's white supremacist, and, and then they're totally against us. Wow, I, I just don't know how to deal with this situation. You, you're feeling all the tension, you know, and you're like, is this, we haven't, we haven't really moved along in our society. We haven't really progressed. Have you ever felt like you're isolated and, and just like your cause and your movement and maybe the, um, certain people who look like this, who you see on television, are actually totally against you? And maybe at that moment you're feeling that type of tension. Any of you? Um, so I, I spent some time in the Coast Guard mm -hmm. as an officer, and um, you know, one the Coast Guard has had its own challenges with diversity, um, mm -hmm. both at the academy and in the service. And what we used to do, I was on a ship in Miami, and we used to take on um, a visitor from the Bahamian um, Navy, essentially. And that allowed us to do operations within Bahamian waters because we had a national from the government on the ship. And so whenever we would have discussions around diversity and um, why someone would feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right, um, if they were a person of color in a predominantly white service like the Coast Guard, what I would tell them is, imagine if they were just like the Bahamian rider, if they, if they were the guest on a Bahamian ship where everyone from the Bahamian Navy is essentially black. And I would ask them, do you think you would feel different? And then at that point, the, the answer was always yes, right? And so, um, you know, it, it's not until you're put in those <laughs> shoes, essentially, um, that you can at least try to identify with what people of color um, are experiencing here in this country. Um, I'll stop. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else like to elaborate? I mean, I can't uh, say that I've ever experienced discrimination <laughs> right. at all. Um, and like I've, I've been a couple specific times in my life where I've benefited right. from it. Um, but I mean, within, within the story, like when I read that in that moment, like I read him saying that like white people don't share very well, right? Mm -hmm. Like segre the problem with segregation was that black people's lives got worse, right? right? Um, mm -hmm. That white people, and particularly this is talking about black Harlem, like in that, right? right? But like that, that, yeah, like we we made it impossible for it to actually be sustainable for everybody. Mm -hmm. As that's how I read it in that moment, right. and and I think you see reflections of that in Charlottesville and. Absolutely and kind of white extremism and, mm -hmm. and supremacy to that degree. Um, but, uh, but it was interesting. That, that scene definitely made me pause and think, oh, like, all right, do we ruin everything? Like, mm. we, we might, uh, at least we have. Yeah. Dr. Staggers, Hakeem? Yeah, I am thinking about something, I, and this is actually outside of the text, but just in terms of the use of language. Mm. So in terms of segregation and integration, but then also there's the piece around pluralism, right? Mm. Um, and I, I think kind of picking, piggybacking on some of the points that were made, um, it's easy, I think, for us to assume that when there is um, um, integration, mm -hmm. that people are equal, right? Because so much of the language around desegregation was actually making things equal. Right. And so there's the assumption that mm -hmm. if we see representation, which is what desegregation was supposed to do, integration was supposed to do, so representation supposedly, right? right. Um, what we consider to be diversity, that mm -hmm. people are actually equal. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not correct. Um, the other part of that, though, too, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, though, too, mm -hmm. is that we don't um, always speak to the value. And I think because of this, though, too, we don't always value pluralism, you know, in terms Absolutely. of recognizing people and ethnicities and recognizing the value of what people actually bring. And, and I think that there's something to be lost in that. I'm not suggesting that, you know what, so we should uphold segregation, not at all. What, I'm, what I am suggesting, that too, is that we, we lose sight of, of valuing people mm -hmm. and, and the richness that, that different people bring. Um, and, and jumping to another step, though, too, in terms of how this um, 
I would actually speak to, to some people and probably mm -hmm. uh, folks who are uh, probably considered the minority when they, when they speak about um, with, around conversations of segregation, this is just a mm -hmm. point, and this is not necessarily where, where I am coming into this. Um, but uh, historically, you know, groups that have been able to flourish, they actually start in what they, we call enclave societies, right? So people actually go to a particular group. So when people are coming into, speaking about immigrants, people are coming into a country, they may actually go into a group, okay? So even if we're talking about, um, we see a lot of the, these small towns. So if we talk about, um, say, Haitian communities, this is probably not the best example, but if we look at certain communities across the country, we look at communities in Florida, uh, communities in Cuba and Florida, for example, or even um, Chinatowns around the country, people actually go to communities, right, where people are receiving them to help build up. Uh, for African American people of color, it with with desegregation, some, that part was lost in terms of building businesses and, and that particular capital and community. So there are, when people speak about that, that loss for African Americans, that's what people may be speaking to in terms of the economic capital building businesses. And when that, and, and part of it though too, wasn't just, um, well, partially desegregation, but we can also, we can also speak to um, other, um, very specific um, tactics and strategies that were actually used to uh, destroy that wealth and that economy. So there, there are a group of people who speak to that and who mourn the loss of building that capital, um, particularly for, um, for African Americans when we speak about segregation and desegregation and how communities weren't able to build up that way. But that's very separate. And that, that, that's a different conversation <laughs> than saying that, you know what, again, everyone should not be represented. Okay, uh, because the other piece, though, too, when we, again, go back to this notion that desegregation means that we're all valued, it doesn't mean that way. We have to be very conscious to make sure that, that, we, that we appreciate who's in the room and that we value what people are bringing. So we, we, we have to still do that work. Thank you very much. Um, in the book Homegoing by Yao Gisi, the character Mese insists to James, I will be my own nation. Have you ever felt like you have to be your own nation because of discrimination, prejudice, injustices that you see around or have faced maybe as a person of color or a person of European descent? Have you ever felt isolated or felt like in your own personal life where you had to be your own nation? There was no one else who would speak out and have deliver your voice, have your own voice. So has that, has that ever happened to any one of you? And have you ever experienced that? So I think um, it, happens for all, it happens for all of us in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could speak to experiences of being the you know, only Latino student in a class in college or being the only Latino legislator in a group of other legislators. Uh, whatever it is, I think we all find ourselves as being the only one. You could be the only male in a group of women, right? I work in nonprofit industry, and every time I'm at some professional development training, I'm the only male because all the other nonprofit directors are females. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that is an experience that I've lived with since, you know, Absolutely. probably since college because I was raised in a diverse community and never kind of experienced it at, at that younger age. But when I speak to other young people and, and I'm mentoring young people, I explain to them that, you know, as a person of color, this is the reality that we live in in, in our society. And, you know, um, it's better to get the training early on. I see it as training, right? And so that way you can navigate those waters. Because we can become very resistant. We can become very comfortable in our environments. Um, that we're used to and where we feel comfortable. But when we're uncomfortable, that's when we grow. Mm -hmm. So I try to work with young people, um, and that's what I do in my day job. You know, for instance, we work with young people getting them to college, and some of them will go off to predominantly white institutions, right? Like, let's say, Bates College or something like that. And we have to prepare them, you know, through, through multiple conversations to say, you're going to be the only one in your classroom, right? And that's okay, right? Because that's going to be training um, for you, and there are going to be resources for you um, to help you through that on your campus. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Um, in the past nine months, we've seen a lot of changes that have taken place in our, in our nation. 
And whether you, well, I don't, whether, it, doesn't depend, it doesn't matter what political party you're on or what side you're on, but we have seen a lot of drastic changes that have occurred. And in the past couple of months, there have been a lot of changes that truly affect a lot of our, our, our immigrant population and, and many people who do not have a voice. What solutions would you have for some of the people in this room, you know, who have friends, who, you know, really want to make change and who are, you know, desperately seeking help for some of their friends because of the political policies, the policies that are changing and legislation. Um, you know, it's just, it's, you know, we have never seen it to this level on so many levels. I mean, every, every couple of weeks, three weeks, there's something being changed within the government. Um, some policy is being changed. So what, what solutions would you have for them? And how are you dealing with that and combating some of these issues as well? Because these people call this nation their home. As Yao Gisi said, this is also their home as well. But yet, our government at this point is you know, dealing with the situation a little different. So, and I'm being politically correct at this point, okay? <laughs> but, so how would you address this issue? Well, I think you need to educate yourself because there's a lot of held beliefs about how things operate that may just be, um, they're, they're just beliefs in how things are run. Um, in every one of our workplaces, there's ways things are done and then there's policies and sometimes those things conflict with each other. Um, but the policies at the end of the day are what usually are uh, bringing people to court or um, able to, to help protect or uh, uh, to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that we're, first, that we're educated in knowing what the policies Absolutely. are. I think in particular with immigration, um, that you do know and that you attend other sessions. There was a great session last year, um, mm -hmm. or maybe it was this year, with um, attorney Michael Doyle down in New London, a New London public school mm -hmm. system, to help educate um, people on what their rights are, one as an immigrant, one as someone who may or may not be uh, documented, but who would really know what they can and um, do not need to share with other people. Um, as a principal in our last, uh, we had an administrative meeting last month, and principals are asking questions that I'm surprised that they don't know the answers to about whether ICE can come into um, a school to remove Sorry. children or just even to be aware of the right questions to ask if someone's mm -hmm. coming into your school to question someone. Um, and to me, you know, I've been a principal for two years and I knew the answer to the question and I'm looking at you know, colleagues who've been principals for 25 years in the same city who, this is not the first time that, um, that this is an issue within, the, um, within Hartford. Um, but they just don't know. And so I think it's important that we educate e each other, that we educate ourselves, that if you find information, um, that you also make sure that it's accurate before passing it on, um, and that you continue to, uh, to look for ways to learn what really the policies are. But then you also take action with legislators and other uh, lawmakers within your community to tell mm -hmm. them what you truly believe uh, needs to happen, um, and that you get to know um, people that this is this is affecting so whether it's you your family or other neighbors that you get to know what the real issues are um, and the best ways to be able to protect or um, how it is that they need support um, and you need to, to know that from them um, and not just assume things as well you know for me not being somebody who is experiencing any of the laws that he's passing right now mm -hmm. um, or, or, or detracting um, the question is like, how do you be an ally for people who are impacted, right? Um, the government authority is is not moral authority, right? And I, I do I I advocate breaking laws that are unjust. Um, if there's somewhere I, that we can go to the local INS office and like register ourselves and say, yep, I'm an undocumented immigrant, even though I was born in Norwich, Connecticut. Um, like anything to gum up the works. If we see the government hurting people, like it's our job to stop the government from hurting people. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I don't have the, the exact list right now of ways to do that, but, but, you know, not be intimidated by it because when that's what a bully wants is a bully wants to intimidate you into not doing anything. And we can't let ourselves be intimidated into inaction. Mm -hmm. It's our responsibility. That's right. Thank you very much. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up to this wonderful audience here 
And if you have a few questions, um, I would love for you to ask some questions to this extraordinary panel. Um, who, who has the courage to ask a question? Mr. Booker, at first, I'd be remiss, amiss if I didn't thank you and this fine panel for such a elated evening. Um, my question is this. Don't you believe that labeling is the cancer within mm. our society? For it's the constant advertisement of our differences. Mm. As this gentleman said, I feel in today's age and time, mm -hmm. it's a great need of, of not recognizing of what's different, but the similarities mm. of each and all. I can see your face, Christina. <laughs> you want to say something. Um, as far as labels go, when I first started at my job so many years ago, like I said my, earlier, my maiden name is McLaughlin. Would you think that to look at me? Probably <laughs> not. So uh, shortly after I started, one woman came back from maternity leave and she was introduced to me and said, someone said, oh, there's Christina McLaughlin. And she told me that she was looking for a redheaded fair-skinned person, and I'm like, <laughs> no. Um, when I had gone to Three Rivers a long time ago, um, you know, the professor's calling the names out to, for attendance, and when he said Christina McLaughlin, and I raised my hand, he gave me that look like, what? And later on, he asked me, was that my married name, or was I adopted? And I'm like, no, that's my mate, that's my maiden name, my birth name. Uh, I've, people have come up to me, speak Spanish to me all the time, and I, you know, I smile. I took Spanish in high school. I grew up, um, one of my best friends is Puerto Rican, so I, I can talk back to you slowly. Not as fast as Chris here. But, uh, you know, so those labels have always been there, and I still kind of experience it now. You know, I kid around with it because that's just who I am. You know, I, I embrace who I am. I don't let those labels right. get to me, but I use it to sometimes be an icebreaker or to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is sad that there are still labels out there when my son was young, younger, uh, my, my son is fairer than I am, but you know, I found that it was more beneficial for him to use the label of Asian American to have um, access to other programs that I couldn't get because I made too much money or was a single parent for a long time. So uh, on those same forms that we filled out when I was little, I labeled him as Asian American to help him get the services he needed. Even though he would look at me, he was like, but mommy, I don't look you know, I don't have your eyes, I don't have your skin color. I'm like, I, I understand right. that. You know, you're just a part of me, but right mm -hmm. now we're going to use this to help what you know, we need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unfortunately, you know, we don't want to use the labels, but it's just in our nature for now to use labels, but you just have to kind of embrace it and not let it get to you. Oh, I see two, I see two other questions, but yes, please. I just want to speak to the label piece, and I'll, I'll be brief. I, and I think, mm -hmm. Identity, I guess part of that would be labeling, but we have to recognize that too, we're talking about these labels, that there's been this value that's been attached to the labels. Mm. And that's the part that needs to be deconstructed. Again, for, for people to be able to identify and to talk about you know, where they're from and to feel close to, to, to who, what, what culture makes them, that's rich, it's wonderful. People should be, we should be celebrating that. And we should be celebrating those differences I, I would say all the time, right? And that's what makes us beautiful as human beings, right? Um, the challenge, though, too, is, is when we don't deconstruct the value and when we don't understand that those values were intentional. And we have that, that's part, again, of, of that, the, the history pieces as well in terms of, you know, just out of convenience, black and white, right? And then, and then labeling some, you know, the, these categories that people were stuck in. Mm -hmm historically, and, and then even when the labels came about and why it was essential mm. to be able to put people in these boxes and how that's, again, become something that in our society we just know and how we recognize people. There's certain descriptions that we kind of then label people as such. And that's the problem, the values attached to that. You know, not, not, not the, the physical differences that we see that make us each, you know, unique and beautiful, and w which should be celebrated. Awesome. Yeah. Um, my question for the panelists. How do you feel we need to educate our educators when teaching kids like me about A, ourselves, B, where we come from, and C, 
see how do we change our communities? That was um, an excellent question there from a high school there. student. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Uh, so I'll give an example of something that happened last week. So we're putting together class size, classes and we're moving some students around because uh, you know, parents have recommendations of who would be the best teacher for their kids and things like that. And um, so one of the teachers uh, told me, we made a couple moves in his classroom, had um, like 14 boys and six girls. And he was a little concerned about the you know, the balance. I'm like, okay, you know, but the teachers from the year before had created the list. So we had to move some things around and we were trying to maybe balance it a little bit better. So um, I removed a student by the name of John from his class and then we added two girls. I think we maybe moved out another student, but I can't remember. Um, the two girls' names uh, were Noelle and Dandy Elias. And his text message back to me was, um, please just move it back. John's name is easier to spell. And I'm like sitting oh. there like, <laughs> wow. Um, but, the, you know, obviously that's uh, that in itself is an ignorant comment. It's racist. Um, but he was very blind to this. Now, he's taught at my school in particular for 15 years. So it's not like he is to, to him. It was funny, um, but it's not really funny because both of these young ladies have probably had their names misspelled and, and mm -hmm. misspoke many times. And I always find it incredibly important to understand how to say a student's name and how to spell it. Because um, that's who they are, it's part of their identity. And so I think as a, a principal, educator, person in general, you need to be one, you have to educate yourself so you do know um, bl uh, blind, blindness in your own life, I think, to things that are racist or biased. Um, but then be willing to have the conversation and to figure out how to say it. So um, to talk with him, for me just to tell him, uh, Mr. So-and-so, that's racist, um, may go some places for some people and may not for others. It wouldn't for this teacher in particular. So I had to figure out a way in order to address it. But for him to understand, um, you know, it's actually harmful to think that way about your children, about your students. And um, so being willing, I think, to call those things out. But I think as students, um, in a classroom of being willing to talk to your teachers about things that they say um, that are hurtful or biased as well. Now there's ways to say it to be heard, right? So you could stand up in a classroom and say that's racist or that's really a biased opinion about something um, in a way that's disrespectful and someone may not hear you well. But you can also have a conversation with the teacher on the side or if it's appropriate, you can have the conversation right there in the classroom and bring something up. Um, but I think it's important to figure out how people can hear you if you want the conversation to go in a way that's going to change their mindset. Um, sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't. It depends on, I guess, the situation. But I think overall, like, how do you educate your educators? Um, they need, people need to experience things. So, um, like I shared the, the example of going to the Black Hills in South Dakota and speaking with a gentleman from, um, from a different community than I, who had a different story that I had known about uh, what happened to his people, um, that impacted me tremendously to think different, to dig in deeper in stories, and, um, and those experiences change us. So we all have different experiences on things that make you think differently. And so as a principal, I try to create that for my teachers. I think as uh, a students, you can ask them questions that make them think differently about it or tell them about your own experiences. Um, but that, I guess that would be my advice in that way. I, I mean, from my perspective, uh, particularly when you're looking at white teachers, right, teaching them to actually examine what it means to be white in this country. Mm. You know, when we teach race, we teach other people's race, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, but white people have a race too, but we don't, we're not encouraged to self-examine it to see the way that it's kind of integrated into the way we interact with people, um, the way that it is, been built into power structures of schools, mm. right? Um, uh, the same, I mean, I'm talking about race, but uh, I also see this in gender. You know, my, I work at a sexual assault and domestic violence agency. When you want to look at sexual violence, you can't just look at women, right? We have to look at who is doing majority of sexual assault, which is men and masculinity. Um, but so, you know, that, that time to do self-reflection, it's hard when you're at a strapped school which barely has time to put math books in their math teacher's hands before class starts. Um, I don't have a good solution for like what system could be better, but I know it needs to be integrated all the time. Um, 
you know, at Safe Futures, we, work, we have prevention programs. Um, and so we actually, in sixth grade, in our sixth grade lessons, we do have a, um, we teach for two weeks in a row about prejudice. And it's a challenge every year to figure out how do we do this in the different schools. We can go to a school that's majority kids of color, and then the very next day have to teach the same lesson in a school that is 90, 95% kids who are white. Mm -hmm. And like, and it just can't be the same lesson, right? It, you have to, there's different things to learn in each of those classrooms. I can't teach, as a white teacher, I can't teach a 90, 95% kid of color classroom mm. what discrimination is in, a, in the same way, because you're, you're, you're teaching people about the, they're all, like what they've already experienced, mm -hmm. right? But we're trying to teach the white students about, hey, this is actually what white people do, or this is what is in our society, and, mm. um, and it does. It takes a lot of that self-reflection work, but you know, it, it takes reading real history as well as yeah, that, that emotional work. So say to, to ask what to, to push I want to say this carefully I mean, initially I want to say push back by, by asking questions mm -hmm. as well to particularly when you know that information has been um, excluded um, and asking the question why I think about this uh, my mother was a history teacher and I remember I think it was probably ninth grade Western Civ and um, in the book I ironically um, there wasn't much of Africa wasn't in the Western Civilization book, um, but the, at the first chapter included a section on Egypt, and that is kind of interesting. Anyways, as I speak about it, however, that section was omitted. So the Western Civ teacher, even though this this particular textbook included a, a chapter on Egypt, he didn't speak about it. And I remember having a conversation with my mother because that was the only time I, I and with the, in this book for the most part that. Um, uh, non-white people were actually discussed. Uh, and my mother, a history teacher, um, same um, city, um, said, you know what, ask him. Ask him why that particular chapter, that particular section is being excluded. I did. His response did, did not tell me much. But I, I think that's still important. And, and, I, and I say that now, particularly at this point in time, as Mr. Booker started with, the fact that you know that over the last several years, uh, there's been um, a, a lot of attention around certain injustices. And, and to this, we'll speak to the fact that students are powerful. right? So whether we talk about um, high school students, talk about college students, OK? And student activism is, is not new. <laughs> Right? But students are powerful in terms of really asking for and pushing for what it is that they need. If there's something that's excluded and something that seems like an injustice. So, so I, I think that it's important to, to, to raise the question to um, not be silent, mm -hmm. right? And to, to use your voice. Um, for my panelists, my extraordinary panelists, please give them a round of applause. Everyone. Each one of them, can you leave them with um, some words of encouragement or just a statement that you would like to leave them with? Greatly appreciate it. We'll start off with um, you, Principal Thompson. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. <laughs> well, I think, um, so I guess the words of wisdom would be um, to, to seek to understand and to know the stories that you don't know. And just because you don't know something, that's not an excuse because we live in an age where we have access to many things, uh, whether it's the internet or just people. And we are created with really unique stories to be understood and um, to share those with other people. And so I would encourage you, one, only not to share your own stories, but to ask questions and to seek out understanding from other people, whether it's your elders in your community or the 11th grade student in the back named Jabril or other students um, and other children um, to really ask questions and understand more about their story and what, um, what they've experienced. And then to share those stories, obviously in appropriate ways, but to share the information that you're now gleaning off um, to really build off a, a more true picture of what the world is and um, who the people are around you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Soto. Um, duty demands courage. And that is ringing true for me today in light of what is happening both locally and nationally. And a lot of people are home tonight, not here with you joining us tonight. And so I get a sense that you all have, have a self sense of duty, right? Mm -hmm. To educate yourselves, 
um, to be active in this time where we need activism. And so the next piece of that is the courage that it takes to really manifest that out to others, right? It's easy um, to stay home tonight, but you didn't stay home. But then the next step is the courage that it takes to share this with somebody else. I would say don't settle for those simple answers, yes or no. Um, ask why is it yes or no? Um, you know, that's a society we live in today. You want to know more, you want more knowledge, you want to be able to pass that on to your own children, your friends, um, your own life stories, pass it on. You know, I'm constantly trying to tell my son lots of things. He's my only child, so take all this information in. <laughs> um, if your parents have something to tell you, stories, listen to them. Um, like I said before, my mom has passed away, but there are sometimes she was a type of person that would tell you the same story 20 times. And you're like, Mom, I already heard that story. But you know, thinking back, she's no longer here. I want to hear those stories again. So that way you understand what she was trying to say, what message she was trying to convey. That way you can also do the same thing going forward. You know, pay it forward for others. That would mm. be my, my message. Mm. Yeah, continue to learn. Um, you know, read alternative histories, read radical histories. Yeah. People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn is a great place yeah. to start. Gerald Horn is a historian out of the University of Houston who's written some amazing books. Mm. Um, and then, and yeah, then act. Do it now, you know? Don't wait for the perfect action. Do what's needed, right? If, if we need to talk about DACA tomorrow, do anything to talk about DACA tomorrow. Absolutely. Um, but, but don't wait. And for me, I would, I, there's a statement that I actually heard at a training, um, and it's that my humanity is connected to your humanity. And I think that's so important that when we're talking about issues of injustice um, and power and privilege, that it may, folks may think that, okay, if someone's being oppressed, okay, it's, I can turn my head to it, but you really can't. Uh, because the demise of another person essentially could be your demise, okay, and it actually kills all of us. Um, so I, I think that that's important, though, too, to recognize as we're, as we're speaking about uh, what's happening in this country, we're speaking about what's happening in the world, and these issues of, of, of power um, and injustice, Okay, and how it's really crushing us and killing us, essentially. We have to recognize that we're, we're connected and that, that our humanity is connected to the humanity of another. Thank you very much, panelists. Awesome. One last thing. It has been proven, scientifically proven, that we are equal. 99.5% of our DNA is the same. Only 0.5% is what separates us, and that's, that's the physical makeup, the physiology. That's what separates us. 99.5%, we are all the same. Only 0.5%. I remember my freshman year of college. I remember the first night when I, when I got to college, and I went to Eastern Connecticut State University, only about 50 minutes away from here. And as you know, in Connecticut, you have 160 towns, and nine towns are where all the minorities are concentrated. So my, my roommate was from one of those 151 towns, so, and I was from the other nine. You know. So what's interesting, when I arrived there, it was about 11.20 PM. I remember the exact time, because I was looking at the clock. And it was our first night. And he looked, we're laying there, and he says, Kevin. And I go, yes, Paul? And he goes, um, are all black people the same color? And I go, no, are all white people the same color, Paul? <laughs> and then he goes, then in my head, I'm like, wow, this guy's asking me some questions, <laughs> right? And then he goes, Kevin, do black people wash their hair every day? This one I had here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, uh, depends on the texture of your hair and everything. And he goes, well, do, uh, then I go, do white people wash their hair every day, Paul? You know? And then he says, um, um, do black, black people, do they, do they tan? And I go, well, it depends on you know, your skin tone. We're all different shades, so it depends on the black person. And, and I said, do all white people sh tan? And he goes, no, depends on the person. Some people burn. And, and I go, oh, OK. So what was interesting was that Paul and I became really good friends. We're still friends today, OK? And the reason why it was because Paul had courage. He was courageous. 
Paul had the courage to talk to me because he grew up in a community where he was in his own little bubble, but he said, I'm not going to stay in my little bubble. And I remember when I, 10 years ago, when I was teaching middle school, and when I was teaching middle school, one of my seventh graders came up to me and he said, Mr. Booker, he said, can we memorize this poem? And I said, what poem? Lewis, he said, we got to memorize this poem. Now, he's at Harvard University now, which was kind of interesting, right? He said, we got to memorize this poem. And I said, the poem is called Excuses. And the poem goes like this. It says, excuses, excuses, excuses. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent, which create monuments of nothingness. And those who specialize and the use of these tools seldom amount to anything. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent, which create monuments of what? Nothingness. And those who specialize in the use of these tools seldom amount to anything. What I learned from that 12-year-old that day 10 years ago is that I cannot continue to make excuses as to what I need to learn about other people, where I need to learn about their home, their place, and how we all are interconnected. I learned that from a 12-year-old. Never, ever allow myself to make excuses. And one of my mentors, who's 86 years old, and we hang out every week, and he said to me, Sunday, he said, I keep myself around young people. And I said, what, Charlie? I keep myself around young people so that I don't become stagnant. Mm -hmm. And I said, sheesh, you know what? At my age now, I'm going to make sure I don't become stagnant either. You know? And then you're always learning something new. Mm -hmm. So remember, Nelson, the former president Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. Let's continue to educate ourselves. Let's continue to have these courageous conversations. Let's continue to, to step outside of this beautiful library so that we can impact our communities. That's why I chose this extraordinary panel here. I appreciate all of you. I love all of you for being here. Thank you so much. And I love all of you in this audience.